Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. I'm Jessica Lesson, and I uh, founded the information. Uh, we're an economist for the tech industry, and we do have a special partnership with DLD. So if you see a big card with an eye on it, um, our first ever um, partnership to um, I hope that many of you will try us out, and many of you have. So um, a short plug, but it, it's wonderful to be here. And it's out wonderful to be here with with two journalists who every time I, I see an article pass with their name by, hesitate to click on it because I know it's gonna be important and insightful and probably something I wish I had written. So, uh, of course, John Markoff from the New York Times and Stephen Levy from Wired. Um, to start, let, let's pick up on what Steffi said and, and look back. I mean, we, we tend to cover the tech industry in real time and to think about what happened yesterday or an hour ago, um, but you guys, have been covering this transformation for decades. And I wonder if you might start and just take turns by reflecting on you know, what's changed over the, the past 20 or years. And I, I know that's broad, but I think people would be interested in the sort of first things that jump to mind when, when you do look back. Uh, so everything's very different, but everything's the same. I mean. You know, people talk about the difference between mainstream media and new media, but I was thinking about this before I came up here, and neither Stephen and I had journalism degrees. There was a time when you had to have a journalism degree to work for a newspaper, and we were the first wave that broke that down. Um, we came out of this thing that was a hobbyist industry that happened to turn into what John Doerr called the largest legal accumulation of, waste, of wealth in history. Waste. Waste. <laughs> And uh, people were making it up as, as they went along. We were all hobbyists, and uh, it, it feels actually similar to what's going on today in some ways. Yeah, from, from my point of view, I jumped in. I was writing about um, all sorts of things, from sports to music, uh, interviewed Bob Marley, things like that, and just did a story for Rolling Stone about computer hackers. And I thought, these people are amazing. Uh, this world is amazing. I'd never touched the computer before that story. And you know, actually, they say 20 years, they're being a little generous. It's uh, maybe closer to 30, than, you know. Uh, closer to 40. But John was doing it before me. He's sort of the old man of the industry. Uh, uh, but, uh, and and it, it's utterly right. Back then, computer journalism, at the end of every story, it had a, just a little thing with, with the writer's phone number in case you wanted to call the writer and contact the person and ask them. Fax know, numbers too. How to do some code, right? You know, you know because you, know, you would get stuck. It, you know, people like relied on each other. And it was like a very a small thing. And very quickly during the, the early 80s, there was this huge uh, boom as people began to realize there's actually money in this. And there's been you know, rises and falls. But as John says, it, Essentially, it, it's not much different. I, I think that you know uh, it, we sort of like bob on the on the on the water as the you know, as, as it rises and falls, but and just do the same thing. But when you mean not much different, do you mean in terms of the art of reporting and what you're writing? Because the audience has changed dramatically, right? I mean, you're now read by you know just orders of magnitude more people. It was much more vertical. Now everything is horizontal. That's one of the differences. There, there is no. Electronic Engineering Times. Electronic Engineering Times writes for the whole world. So all the boundaries have been, been broken down. That's one thing that's different. Yeah, uh, over the years, it, it's, it's the year of dropped modifiers. Before, when we started, everything had the word computer before it, right? You know, uh, or digital. And, and, and that sort of went away, or E even, you know. So, so now there's not email, there's just mail. You know, um, and you know, pretty much everything you know, becomes the the mainstream, and you don't need to modify it. Like the word mobile, for instance, is sort of fading away as everything is mobile. You don't need you know, to, to, to do the modifier to, to describe it then. But back then, just the idea of, of having a keyboard and a screen on your desk was kind of unusual. I, I wrote for a magazine called uh, Popular Computing. You know, I, I, you know uh, when I got into it and started writing more about it after that Rolling Stone story, I was writing a first also for the mainstream press, because they were happy that someone who had uh, some history of writing, knew how to write a, a feature story, was interested in this stuff, which they wanted to get into. But I also wrote for this magazine called Popular Computing. And uh, sometime a few months afterwards, they asked me 
if my wife could pose for a story on women in computing. Now, she wasn't involved in the industry. She just used a, one of the Apple computers I bought after the first one. And because she used the word processor, they did a full-page picture of her in this feature. Well, you know. That's a... Uh says a lot, actually, but we can just... Um, so what about the competitive landscape, though, right? So in the sense that um, there are more outlets um, competing, writing about the same things, uh, competing for readers' attention. You know, I like to say that we're competitive with Instagram because if you're looking at your phone, you're either going to read the information or click on Instagram, right? So how, how have you guys thought about that, and how has it changed how you do your jobs? So in one sense, everything's changed. In another sense, you know, I still like to write for the front page of the New York Times, so nothing has changed. Uh, it is very confusing to try to figure out who our audience is now, and I, I will be honest. That was my next question. <laughs> I have no clue. Um, I, I, and because I don't have a clue about the way it's changed, I write from the audience that I wrote for for the last 20 years, and it seems to more or less work. Um, but there are different metrics. Uh, the metric we never had before is most emailed. And so that's creeped into the way the you know the way you think about things. And if you're on that list, the world is good. It's sort of like what was being on the front page of the New York Times before. Yeah. Well, there, there is this surge, and you know, and there's you know, it, it's amazingly competitive now. Uh, that everything that happens is like, like a, a big story, and much of it goes away within not even the next day, with, within a few hours, uh, and. You know, there's a lot of people and a lot of publications that you know have, have huge staffs, publications that didn't exist. I'll, I'll accept yours from that because yours is, is, is a little different. But you know, they have people writing multiple items every day, uh, and you know, any piece of news they just grab at, and often a piece of news is someone else's article that they just paraphrase and 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 put in there. Um, and you know, uh, what I found is. Uh, for, for me, to try to do what, I, what I've always done, not you know, you know, go in, in terms of, of uh, quantity, but uh, do a, a story which, which takes a, a longer time to do, maybe, um, and you know, as, as a benefit of you know, uh, diving into it, I'll try to get you know, people to show me stuff sometimes before other people see it. Uh, and you know, what, what I post not only just in the pages of Wired, which is you know, like a big deal, it's a, Feature we take weeks to edit it and, and you know, produce it, um, and months really uh, in the whole process. But f even on the web, I'll try to do something uh, which is something no one else has, uh, and I think that's the way to do it. And actually, and it's not just because of my access to do it. I think you know, anyone who takes the time can, who, who, with a, a reasonable amount of talent uh, from a reputable publication, can get in there and do a story that stands out. And I think probably that's what your publication is, is, is based on, isn't it? Yeah, we are. We're trying to not do the news of the day that's already out there, but stories that we think will deliver value um, that might not get written otherwise, you know, with original reporting and analysis. And it's funny, Steve, I think we, um, before I started the information, was at the Wall Street Journal. Um, actually, I think I had just left, but I had heard that Nest was launching a smoke detector mm -hmm. and just sort of put that out there um, as a little news nugget. And you had, am I getting this right? You had the exclusive, right? I mean, you had um, the interview with Tony, all the product details. And you know, maybe we stung a tiny bit by having our news out there. But your piece was still an authoritative piece that came out later that many people read for and found a lot of value from. And, and I think that um, we are getting stuck in this, you know, being first is, is the only metric that matters. And, and that piece, you know, I found it incredibly interesting. I think it was at the top of tech meme and, and all of that stuff. So Well, it was interesting because when you came across with your, you know, uh, first, you know, a, a alert uh, that that thing was happening, there were some people at my publication said, oh, my God, is the embargo broken? You know, should we go with this now? And, you know, I... You know, was particularly adamant to join with the, with the people saying, no, 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 we, we have to keep, you know, we, we checked with, with Nest, and they said, no, 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 the, you know, the, the, the details aren't in it. You still have all, all the stuff, Stephen, don't worry about it. And, you know, and, and of course, I was not going to burn the place that gave me the, the, the trust there. And I think that's something that maybe is a, a, a little different. I think that people aren't so much interested in building long-term trust 
with their sources because they're under such pressure to produce now and produce something quickly uh, rather than develop those longer term relationships. So there's, there is a lot of great in-depth reporting still, but there is this fast twitch thing that actually I, I am a, a, just aghast about an example. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, uh, a biophysicist at Stanford whose name is Manu Prakash um, introduced, or it, the story came out that he had a very inexpensive paper microscope, fold scope. It was really quite a remarkable thing. And it got a tremendous amount of coverage. Um, the best story for the Stanford Hospital in the history of the hospital in terms of viralness. Everybody picked it up. And I had known Manu Prakash for a year, and I was away on book leave, and so I was kind of heartbroken I'd lost the story. And then I went and looked, and I systematically looked at every one of the stories, and I define you to find any of what I call reporting. Nobody had done any reporting. No one had called Manu. Some people had picked up his TED Talk, and they took their quotes from his TED Talk, and nobody had gone to an a independent source to ask about what this meant. There was nothing. And I think that that's more common than it's not. And that's a, that's a really bad trend. I think there are, I think there's hope on the horizon, in part when we think about different business models for the industry. But um, I want to switch gears slightly and ask a topic. Um, you know, I think one of the consequences of this fast twitch journalism is a lot of picking up other people's stuff. And I will say, Stephen, that I read a story in Business Insider recently that felt like it was half your book on Google. And I like Nick Carlson, he did this nice piece on Larry Page. but. Um, it felt like, and he credited you, and he praised your journalism, and it was above board, if you will. But it seems like there's this other trend. I don't know if it's curating other people's content, regurgitating other people's content. I'll let you guys describe it. But as sort of authorities who have been covering this stuff through books, through articles, um, I, I see little tidbits of you everywhere and wondering what you think about S that. Stephen, you should talk about it without naming names. Yeah, well... And, 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 and that story in particular, it was interesting. You know, right, Nick did credit me, and, you know, and, I, and I, 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 I actually did contact, he actually flagged me a couple days before saying, you know, I'm writing a story that owes a lot to yours, and, you know, I, I realized I saw what he meant when it, when it, when it came out, but, that, you know, and, and he did it fairly, but I felt, you know, when I did a book on Google, um, I knew Ken Oletta was coming out with a book, um, Ken's a great reporter, and I knew that you know he would have a, a, a lot of great stuff in there, um, and his book would come out before mine. I would even read it before I finished writing my book. And what I saw it as was an opportunity for me to lift my game. It was a challenge to do more to make sure that you know uh, that obviously I, I, I'd read his book and see if I missed anything. But I, what I wanted to do was I had to work harder to get something fresh on every page, um, and you know I, I think. That's a, a better way to break something new there. Now, interestingly, um, Nick did uh, some extra items of, of outtakes from his story. And one of them was something that was taken 100% from my book, which he did credit. He said, and here's this story where uh, Google almost got bought for uh, $1.6 million very early in the process before uh, they got venture funding. Um, and he told the story straight from my book, and then he said, and yeah, and as Stephen Levy says in, in my book, and then someone else aggregated it, paraphrased his story almost verbatim, but left out the mention that he got it from me. So, uh, you know, and then people started tweeting that, and the loop had been completed, and I was sort of out of the whole loop. Yeah, and you can chime back in, but it, it's hard, right? I mean, yeah, you're, you're out of it, and... Um I, I think that that's kind of, I don't know what the solution to that is, but I, I wish that the answer was, if there's something great out there, let's try to find something that's also great and different or that's better or instead Ted, of. Ted Nelson thought he had the solution. Hyperlinks needed to be two ways. Yeah, yeah. You can get there. Someone did recently approach me and say, is there a way to screen capture to figure out if something's in. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're journalists, right? Not technologists. Well, well actually, I've, I've, I've actually said, you know, um, uh, at, at Google that I always felt that Google News should, you know, uh, be more alert to where the original story came from. Quite often, you know, and, and in the search engine too, quite often the, you know, if you'll search for something, uh, whether on Google News or even in the main search engine, you know, uh, the aggregation story will come before the original story there. But, uh, but it raises, a, 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 things have changed. And let me give you an example. <clears throat> I spent about four months trying to break the story of the Google car, self-driving car. And, I've, I, and once upon a time, I was a beat uh, reporter who covered Google. 
and we had a love-hate relationship at best. And there were times in the past when Google executives, not to name names, but Eric Schmidt, um, <laughs> called the AP to break my exclusives. That happened a couple of times. In this case, they didn't. They were courteous. They put up a blog post at the same moment my story ran. But it allowed the entire rest of the blogosphere to take the story without crediting me, and I realized the world's different. Yeah. Do you think, um, have companies like Google become harder to sort of penetrate and get inside in, in terms of reporting or easier or what, I mean, take any big company, right? I think this is a, a question that you guys have a great perspective on in terms of really getting inside these companies. So, you know, four years ago I moved to the science section and I have to tell you one of the things I enjoy most is not having to be in that free-for-all, that scrum. Um, you go to a college campus and a laboratory and people welcome you with open arms and it's such a different and such a refreshing way to look Run at Run away it. when they see yeah. you, it's a very... <laughs> well, I, I, I find if you have good relationships with the companies, you could, you know, you're not gonna get every story, but you know, you can get good, good stories there. I think the companies are hungry for people to really listen to them and, you know, and, and explain what, what, what's going on with the company because so much of the journalism is quick hit. The, a, an in-depth story, um, you know, people will, will, will embrace. Now, if you total up all the quick hits, uh, they're probably gonna be more page views than the one in-depth story, but that one in-depth story is gonna get a lot of attention and it'll be around for a, a longer period of time there. So I, I think it's probably not as hopeless as you think. It's hopeless if you just wanna go, you know, like run in there and, and, and get something quickly and have them return your call instantly and tell you something they haven't told anyone else. But I, I think that the, the, the companies really want people, uh, journalists to, to come in there and learn about what they do. And I think, as you said, you know, a, a shitty story can spread quickly and have a big impact, but so can a great one. And so, you know, I think what we hear, companies use the word framing a lot. You know, they want to work with us or talk to us because we're going to frame it the right way or yeah, understand I, it. And, and, you know, sometimes that means their way. But, but I think it is an interesting, um, you know, good call, call, content can spread as well quickly. One, um, one, one difficulty, and I think you're referring to that, is that when we started, uh, we would, you know, you would get an interview with Bill Gates. There would be no PR people in the room. You would just go in, it's time to see Bill. And, and you know, and he would just, 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 just go on. And, um, you know, now even the smallest startup has a PR person in the room with you, uh, sitting there, like, taking notes furiously uh, as you interview the, you know, the 19-year-old founder. My, uh, my, one of my old editors at the journal fondly recalled the days when Steve Jobs called him, mm -hmm. you know, so it was also a different era, but um, shifting from the media to just the tech industry, I mean, what topics out there do you think aren't getting enough attention? So either stories that you guys think should be told or maybe are beginning to think about, um, you know, what, what are the important developments that are maybe getting lost in some of the commentary on whatever happened an hour ago? So, uh, you know, I put myself off to the side and uh, I look at it slightly different. You know, I, I made this bet about three or four years ago that, the, uh, that AI and robotics are gonna have the impact on society that PC in the next decade, that PC and the internet had over the last three decades. And what's different is, you know, I began writing about computer networks in the 1970s and it took people about two and a half decades to catch on. Uh, and now it's not like that at all. Um, there are, you know, uh, books like uh, The Second Machine Age and Who Control the Futures are already sort of tightly focused on the impact those technologies might have on the society. I mean, you know, uh, technology used to be covered uh, in a ghetto and now it's Main Street. Um, it sort of began with the internet, but it really has flipped and it is the story. So there are very few sort of nooks and crannies that are not getting covered I feel. What do you? Did, what would be your s s quick summary of what's so exciting to you about robotics, or where? You, what you think the next big step in it in a mainstream well, way is? Um, you know, it, it's we're like frogs in the pot. One one small story. I was at the Stanford golf course on about two weeks ago on a Friday, having breakfast, and somebody pulled up next to my car in a Tesla, and she um, got she opened her trunk and she got her golf cart out and she set it up and she walked away and the golf cart followed her. 
And so I like did a double take and I took a picture and stuff and of course I went to the internet. It's 1795 and you can buy it. And so it, it really is sort of filtering in. There is a Mercedes that drives itself now. It's traffic jam assist and it, it's starting to filter into society. I think, I think basically I, I see it as one story. Uh, you know, and, you know, AI is like, like, like a big part of that story. Sensors everywhere is a story. Obviously, the, the things we carry around in our, in, in our pocket, that's part of it. But just the, you know, it, you could see all the pieces of this one big story. And, and it, it envelopes everything from gadgets to NSA surveillance of, you know, in, 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 in its scope there. And I think that what we could use more of is just connecting the dots and putting it in that context. From a technology point of view, how far away do you think we are as experiencing that as consumers? Because I do think we're in this phase where there are some neat things, but they're not all connected. I'm not sure that we really understand what Nest is going to do or how our lives are going to change fully just because there's a golf cart that can, I mean, is this five years, 10 years, 15 years? It depends, I mean, are you talking about the Turing test? What, what's the, I mean, if you're talking about the Turing test, in 1991, I covered the first Turing test. There was a contest and there were two sets of judges and the Turing test, of course, of course is when will machine have human level intelligence or something like it. There was a set of judges who were, who were computer experts and these things were barely better than the ELISA program. But there were a set of people who came off the street, and for all practical purposes, the Turing test was passed for them in 1991. So it depends, is the question. Yeah, well, I'll de defer to, to William Gibson's uh, saying, yeah, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Good point. Um, I guess just to wrap things up, too, I mean, obviously, I mean, how do you guys think of your careers? And, and in the sense of, you know, being at the Times and Wired forever, um, it's, it's a mini fad to leave a big publication and do a startup, although I actually think it's uh, overblown as a, as a trend. But You can't say that. <laughs> but um, I'd be curious. I mean, have you guys ever thought about, you know, if journalism is your passion, what are the trade-offs between sort of the awesome homes you currently live in and, and the opportunities that could lie elsewhere? Well, I, I work for Newsweek, so nothing is permanent, as it was what I've learned, you know. Uh, uh, and, you know, <laughs> if I wanted to describe my career, I, I would say not over, so. <laughs> okay. Still yeah, it's the same. And I guess I would just say is in the last bubble, I had a chance to become a venture capitalist, and I decided not to, and I consider that to be a good decision. Excellent. Well, thank you, guys. This has been fun, and um, look forward to reading for many Thanks, years Jessica. to come. <laughs>